So here, let's get started anyway. So just a bit of introduction of myself. I'm, I'm Nick Peachy. Um, I have various different roles, which you can see there. Um, and that's why there's a few pictures of me. Um, I'm director of Peachy Publications, uh, which is my own kind of independent publishing company where I uh, publish materials for, for for teaching online and to help teachers develop their understanding of the use of technology, those kinds of things. I'm also an online course developer. I've worked with a wide range of companies from, you know, the standard kind of ELT publishing companies to, you know, um, to Eaton, to I've done some work for Google Labs um, and, um, and a lot of other different institutions of uh, King's College Online developing um, courses for for financial law and things like that so I've, I've sort of done a, a my fair bit of varied uh, course design I'm also a content author and have written and edited a few books on on ELT um, a, a couple of them are you know um, creativity in the English language classroom and, and creativity in global issues in English language classroom which I co-edited with Alan Maley uh, and I'm also a kind of learning technology consultant and do a bit of training and and sort of help people use technology or or help them develop technological products. I'll share the, you the link with you to the end of this presentation and you can have a look through it and as you can see at the bottom of the screen there are all my sort of social media icons and things like that so if you want to check through to do some of the different things that I do you can have a look through those okay <coughs> okay so um I, I wanted to start off a bit by sort of finding out where we are now you know okay you know most of us are in lockdown maybe not all um, and, and sort of looking at what the new normal is at the moment. I've actually set up a little questionnaire for you there and you can either scan this on your QR code and uh, reader and have a look at it or I'll pass a link to you through the chat and it just asks about what you're doing now. Are you teaching online now? Were you teaching online before all of this happened? Um, so there are just a few questions there. Just click through the ones that you think apply to you. Has anybody actually got back to teaching in the classroom um, or do you intend never intend to re work remotely? I just want to see kind of you know which one of those sentences apply to you and uh, and just to sort of know where we are in terms of who we're talking to. So you can either scan the QR code and do that on your phone or follow the link in chat and do it. And we should be able to start seeing some of the results so we know who else is here. Okay. Just give a little bit of time for people to feed those in. So at the moment it looks sort of like the, the kind of the majority of us are, are only have only been thrown into this now and there are a few people who were already doing it and uh, just just a couple of people who weren't doing it who, who have no intention but and nobody's returned to whatever it, the new normal will be yet so that's sort of quite interesting that nobody's sort of uh, back in the classroom yet and I think that could be a long time coming at the, at the way things are going anyway I'll just move on from that and so if that's what's normal at the moment you know quite a lot of people teaching remotely some not in the position to some you know that's been normal for them for some time you know I was thinking about you know where do we go next what happens after this and looking at some of the factors involved you know and I think one of the things we have to be aware of is, is when we go back to the new normal is that you know classes are going to have to be a lot smaller you know we know that we know that you know at least probably for the next year maybe more you know we'll be involved in social distancing even if you're going if you can get into a physical classroom you know if car classes are going to be half the size then presumably what we have to charge for those classes is going to be twice as much you know the economics are still going to be the same you're still going to have to pay the same amount you know to pay to rent your school you know you're still going to have to be, pay the same amount for your staff for your teachers so that means you know either we're going to have to start charging a lot more for classes or 
some somewhere somebody's going to have to 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 start paying people a lot less you know it's it's not the best start to the to the um, presentation but you know that's the reality is that you know all of us work in the real world much as we like to think that education is you know uh, a much more philanthropic activity the fact is you know we're, we're controlled by you know um, those those financial aspects you know we all have to eat we all have to pay rent and you know money does in the end make the world go round so I started thinking about you know what's what's going to be the implications of this you know okay if if, if classes and and going on a course and turning up in a face-to-face -face classroom is that going to be that much more dangerous or that much more expensive than perhaps you know lots more more students are going to be willing to stay online or are going to going to be interested in staying online so the the online market then becomes much bigger and that's quite interesting for me because you know a, a few years back i was working on a hundred percent online school and there were some difficulties with that you know trying to produce good quality online teaching and getting people to pay for good quality online teaching was very difficult you know most of the competition that we were coming up against was very low cost low quality basically a lot of it was you know you will get to speak to a person who can speak english for for half an hour and it will be you know five ten dollars or something like that and it's very difficult to compete in that kind of market and try and offer a quality product unless you're doing the same or somehow you know you're you're getting really good quality teachers very cheaply which is you know potentially you know potentially that could happen okay so i think you know one of the first questions we want to face if if all of us here are really interested in developing and delivering a good quality teaching product is how do we we retain the quality and you know get students to pay for that and and sort of main, make sure we maintain standards you know that's going to be difficult it might be less difficult in that you know okay you know we've thrown literally hundreds of thousands of students in into the position where they're they're having their first mass free trial of online learning in a lot of cases and if that's becoming successful for them and we're delivering a quality product then great they may well stay with us and they may well be willing to pay for it you know some of them might be finding that actually they're enjoying these classes a lot and for some it, they might even think well actually this is better than i was getting in the, in the physical classroom that's a maybe a couple of other things i wanted to throw out there i'll just move some of the things around on my screen so i can see a bit better is you know well what's in it for the students why would they want to stay learning online well actually there's quite a lot of things in it for them you know there's a wider choice for sure you know most students the school that they go to to have their language lessons is dictated to by where they live you know there's probably a limited number of, of physical schools within a reasonable commuting distance from where they are uh, for them to choose from and they have to choose one of those whereas if they start to look for lessons online you know there's a much wider choice you know they could be studying with any school anywhere in the world you know and and there's a much wider range of offerings that they could go for so they can start looking for exactly the course they want and exactly the teacher they want okay they're no longer bound by those sort of convenient times as well you know okay you know if, if you want to study english between you know five in the afternoon in the evening and 10 o'clock at night probably it's quite easy to find a local school for you but if you want to, to study maybe 11 o'clock at night 12 o'clock at night very early in the morning that becomes more difficult so you know actually now if you can study anywhere in the world you can actually choose your time there's going to be a school open somewhere you know whatever time you want to have your lesson so that's something else that's in it for them of course there's the no commuting as well you know especially if you're living in a crowded city you know when we were teaching our, our students in brazil living in sao paulo you know the fact that you don't have to commute saves you a fortune if you can do it do your lesson from home you don't have to find parking you know something else that's good for them again potentially it's lower cost 
you know, most online courses sell up or have been selling much more cheaply than a physical course. You know, and that was the expectation, ex expectation a lot of time that it would be cheaper. So that's something that, you know, maybe we, we might have to fight against. And of course, most online schools and online classes have to be smaller in size. You know, you can't really effectively, I think, put 20 to 30 students into an environment like Zoom and teach them and get them interacting with each other, monitor what they're doing and give them a good quality product. So the class size will have to shrink. Um, in many cases, the classes that we were delivering, or the many, most of the classes we were delivering at, uh, at the school that I worked for, um, were one-to-one -one classes, and students really enjoyed being able to have a one-to-one -one students with the teacher, and that became affordable. So those are a few things that are in it for students. So how about what's in it for the school? Well, okay, if you're launching your online school, you've drastically expanded your addressable market because just like you know the student who has to go to a school that's within reasonable reach of them you know the school if they go online suddenly the whole world is your addressable market you can actually have students from anywhere in the world you don't have to restrict yourself just to where you are physically so you've opened up a whole whole bigger market and a whole bigger opportunity that's great what you might find as well is that you have to be or you can be open 24 7 you know you'll find that you know wherever you are you know somebody in the in the world is going to want to learn english so if you're addressing a global market you know you're not restricted by you know those the hours opening hours that a physical school is is restricted by you know you can be open at 12 o'clock at night or five o'clock in the morning or three o'clock in the morning but you're going to have to figure out how to deal with that but that's something that you might have to do also you know you with a with an online school you've you don't necessarily need a premises you've reduced the classroom costs you know a lot of schools are very restricted but as to how many students they can have in their school at when any one time by the size of the classroom you know with the kind of precautions that we're going to have to take in the future that the number of students you're going to have in your classroom is about to half you know but with an online school you know you can have as many classrooms as you want and you can stack you know, you, you don't have the same restriction about how many students you can have in your school. You know, you've just opened up, you know, the potential to have limitless numbers of students all in your school at the same time. So you have unlimited capacity. You also have the potential to draw on a much wider pool of teachers. You know, you don't have to ship them into your country. You don't have to take the ones that are, are available within a reasonable commuting distance of your country. You can recruit teachers from anywhere in the world now. So, you know, okay, potentially that's another big advantage for you. And of course, there is the potential to re reduce the costs of employing teachers. You know, if they're working from home, you know, you don't have to provide a staff room. Um, you know, there's a lot of uh, contractual things that you might have not have to provide. You don't have to look out after finding them accommodation or something like that if you're in one of those schools that imports teachers. So there are lots of things in it in terms of, sort of advantages for schools. In terms of what schools need to change, you know, is, is that you need to start rethinking your online marketing, particularly, you know, a lot of uh, schools do online marketing now, but they're marketing towards their, lo their local region. Probably a lot of their marketing isn't so much online and is of local billboards or local ads in local magazines, you know, but you have to change your attitude to marketing if you're marketing if you're looking for a glo to, for global students you know have to start thinking about building reputation much more because you know a lot of physical schools their reputation is built locally you know they know people in the area you know they know businesses in the area that they work with but now you have to start building that global reputation and global trust you know 
instead of being able to walk into your school and see what the school's like before before deciding whether they want to hire you you know they're going to be paying for your classes potentially online and so you know that involves a, a much greater element of trust and sort of thinking about how you build that trust with potential customers whether they're individuals or, or corporate customers is quite important you need to learn how to build on and access the connections that your students have and maybe use them as a sort of potential for marketing. You know, can students recommend each other or recommend someone else? You know, most students who want to study online will go to someone they already know at the school, you know, to see what it's like and try and get their recommendation. That's how we got most of our students when we were when we were working in Brazil. Lots of them came through recommendation and you know, if you can figure out a way of giving your students a discount, if they recommend, then that can really help. You know, thinking about international marketing as well. One of the other things schools that will, will need to think about is how do you actually manage a remote team? You know, you have, you know, we had 70 teachers all working from home in a range of different countries. You know, you have to start thinking about managing them. How do you get them to work as a team rather than just being a group of individuals sitting at home, getting demotivated or feeling isolated? You know, how do you make them feel part of your company? Those things are important. You know, if you really want a successful quality school, you need your, your teachers to work as a team and feel like they are a team. You know, we had instances with you know teachers not showing up or being ill or couldn't get connected to a classroom you know you need to build in the sense of responsibility to your school that they're going to get in touch with someone about that, that and let them know or find a, another person from your teaching team who will sub their lesson you know those things are important and yeah of course the other thing is if you're managing you know lessons that could happen at any time of day you need to resource to have teachers available at whatever time of day students want lessons can you find teachers who are willing to be available at five o'clock in the morning or three o'clock in the morning or or nine o'clock in the evening what we found was there's there was a whole chunk of time that was really popular you know there was this phase of time between about nine o'clock in the evening and midnight that most teachers most students wanted their lessons so you needed about 30 teachers available then but another part of the day you maybe you only needed two or three available you know managing your pool of teachers and making sure enough of them get hours and you have enough of them available at different hours is quite a complex fee you know and something that's quite difficult to do but that's something that you need to do if you're going to take on a, a, a kind of 100 percent 24 7 online school okay so now there's the the, the what's in it for teachers bit and, I, and i'm assuming that most people here are teachers or or you know or maybe they're both but so what what's in it for teachers is you know if you like working from home this is great you know you don't have to go out you don't have to start your car you don't even have to put smart trousers on as long as you've got your nice jacket on you know that that can be great and that's that's something you know i work from home all the time and i love it I get to spend more time with my family don't waste time commuting into london you know fantastic you know potentially there's flexibility you know schools are going to want you to be flexible to work different hours and that may well suit you maybe you've got kids that you want to spend the day with all day and after they go to bed you know you can teach through till midnight if you want to or, or you know you can get up at five o'clock and do a lesson if you want to you know so that that can be great the, the other thing is, I guess, is space, you know, that's, that's less of a problem, but less of a, a benefit, but you need to have space to teach, you know, I've got a nice room here, uh, that's reasonably private, you know, and uh, so, you know, I have that space to do it, but you know, you have to think about whether you have that space, whether it's private, whether it's quiet enough, whether you can use the space, you know, but, and of course, you know you have to get set up there's some equipment involved if you want to do this well you know maybe you want lighting equipment you have to have your own laptop you know you need good connectivity maybe you can get the school that employs you to actually pay for that maybe not you know that's something that you maybe you have to think about you know 
if you want to set up independently, you know, all of those start, start things can start coming out of your tax. You know, you can get some money back for using a room of your house for teaching in. You can sort of get the equipment bought from your, from your, your profits, if you like, and reduce the amount of tax you pay. So there kind of are opportunities there. Potentially, teachers could actually cut out the school. You know, if you've got a group of teachers, four or five of you together, and you want to take this on and, and market yourselves, you know, there is the potential to, to, to set up as your own school, even as an individual. You know, if there's just one of you, you can start looking for students, get, get a good Facebook page together and start trying to, to get students in that way. You know, but there, there is a lot of potential I think for teachers and things that you can do if you see this as an opportunity and you know you don't like the way you're working at the moment this is something different and that you could do but, and this leads me on to the other one of the other issues which is the uberfication of teachers you know I, I think uber is a as a customer, for me, Uber is a great firm. They offer a great product and a great service. Really like that you, you can, the flexibility, you can get a car whenever you want. And, you know, it's a great app and things like that. But how do teachers feel about becoming Uberfied themselves? You know, actually, you know, one of the most economical ways for schools to run this, if they're going to 100% on, online, is to treat teachers like Uber teachers. You know, if you, want a, if you want a lesson, a student wants a lesson at this time, who's available? You click on the button on your app and you've got the lesson. You know, th those are the kinds of things that, are, that a lot of online schools have to look at. Can we Uberfy our, our teachers? Do we make them independent freelancers so we don't have to have more expensive con contracts? You know, teachers can be recruited from anywhere, which is great. And, you know, you can work anywhere. And you might, as a teacher, you might find yourself working for three or four different companies if you want to take the kind of, become the kind of Uber teacher. You know, that does ha have impacts for things like, you know, prices and, and what what you can what you'll be paid um, that's one of the big unknowns i think at the at the moment is you know what can we get students to pay for for good quality lessons and you know help how, how and what how much do we end up paying teachers or you know as teachers how much can can we demand you know traditionally the online section has been the kind of bottom feeder section if you like which is unfortunate because you know we've ended up with people delivering classes for you know five dollars an hour or ten dollars an hour and that's you know now we're in the position where we're going to have to try and offer quality language teaching that competes with that and where we can actually pay people a reasonable amount if we can't become the uber style teachers you know what happens to our contracts and our job security you know I've, I've taken a lot of Ubers and, and talked to drivers and most of them, you know, have been quite happy and they feel it kind of fits with their lifestyle and, you know, gives them that flexibility. You know, if that's you as a teacher, then that's great. But, you know, a lot of people want the, the security of the nine to five or need the security of the nine to five job or the two to seven job or, but, you know, they want a contract, they want security and they want healthcare. You know, so what does this mean for us as teachers now? Of course, the other thing that it throws out there is this whole native versus non-native speaker thing as well. You know, most of the most of the particularly low cost schools that are working online always market themselves as offering native speakers. You know, those might be native speakers who have no qualifications ever whatsoever, no teaching uh, experience, but they can speak the language and it could be just somebody who's a student and, and all this kind of thing. You know, it puts that whole area you know something that we've been trying to address for so long back up there you know if people are recruiting internationally and that you know any school in the world can get a native speaker you know what does that do to our non-native speaker to pool of teachers and how do they cope with that you know the fact is that you know when i was working with the the school that i previously previously worked with which was 100% online you know we found that the non-native speakers were actually the most reliable ones and often the most popular ones because often in this environment you need to be able to give tech support as well you know and you want that in your first language you don't want to have to kind of learn the language to do it 
also you know they were very good very committed teachers and very well qualified you know you might find that actually you know where you live you know probably dictates what you can charge as a t or what you need to charge as a teacher so living in a poorer country can make you more much more economical to em employ and you and may that may may be an advantage for you if you're living in a very expensive country you're going to have to charge more and that's going to be more difficult but that's sort of another element of that that, that comes in The other thing, you know, the other thing that's going to impact us is, you know, what about publishing? What about course books? You know, my company produces material, here I'm plugging myself, you know, my company, my company produces materials that were designed to be delivered in this kind of environment. You know, I'm a very small company. There's, there's not many of us or not many of me, you know, not many mouths to feed, you know, and I can pr afford to produce low cost materials that are, that are aimed at teachers so students aren't having to buy a copy so it reduces the all of that threat from copyright they work in, in, in an environment like this you can show them you know you can add audio you can add video i can give away the audio files with them you know whereas for most of the big established publishers that just isn't possible you know that's much more difficult to gather to to, to get together you know I know the ELT publishing community is being really good at the moment, you know, and they're offering lots of lots of freebies, you know, offering ebooks and things like that, and lots offering lots of things for free. But they can't do that forever, you know. At some point, they've got to return to a model that's sustainable for them, so that they can pay people to produce those things. And the vast majority of ELT publishers are built on a biz business model that relies on selling student books to students that's the huge vast part of the ELT, ELT publishing market you know if that's gone and we're all using these digital materials how do they survive you know how do they get around that and I'm sure that's what most most ELT publishers are doing at the moment is sitting there scratching their heads thinking about you know how do we get how do we get around this? How do we protect our copyright? How do we ensure that we're going to make money from our products in the new world? You know, uh, I mean, I worry about it too, but you know, I have less of a worry because I don't, I'm not dependent on the sort of student copies. But that's, you know, all, all my friends who are ELT writers at the moment as well have suddenly had, you know, all of their or most of their projects cancelled because they're based around this model of you know writing course books and all of a sudden everybody's having a rethink and thinking about well how do i do this digitally how do i get it online you know how do i make money for it and how can i employ writers and get writers who are able to do that so that's that's another aspect okay so you know that that's as th those are sort of the things that i want to throw out there uh, uh, about you know generally what's going on you can by all means sh uh, scan the qr code and leave a add a comment if you want to i know loads of people have been posting comments through chat the chat and i'll have a look back at that myself in a minute and, and sort of try and catch up on some of those but but that's my kind of uber rant if you like um you know i, I mean i, I want to leave you on a positive note because you know a lot of this seems quite negative you know the positive note i think is you know this is a huge time of disrupt disruption a huge time of change you know and if you're willing to think about and try to do things differently i think this is a great opportunity you know if you want to stick with what exactly exactly what we were doing six months ago then i think you know you, you could be facing bankruptcy very soon you know it's we've we've got to change we've got to think how how we change and you know most importantly i think we've got to think about how we main, maintain this element of quality in the things that we do and deliver and and still sort of make that financially viable i think that's the single biggest challenge okay um if you've scanned the qr code i'll also pass a link to it for you and for those who who haven't got this qr code scanner handy let's see if i can do that if i can find my chat box i'll, I'll put a link into chat and um i'll show some of the comments let's hope then they're, they're not too uh, none of them are offensive oh. 
there are none. Maybe you're all still typing. Anyway, that, that's as much as I, I have to say. You know, I've thrown a lot of things out there, given, hopefully given you some to, things to think about. And, and now I, I'm happy to ask, answer questions or if anybody wants to get the mic and have a quick say or something like that, we can sort of take it from there. But I'm, I'm happy to do whatever. Maybe Vance, you can, you can sort of start. But that's up to you. Can I ask a question, Nick? Sure. I saw somebody just put up the question of quality, and I think when we start to talk about uberification of the teachers, I wonder how many schools, and I talk as a teacher and a school owner, would be willing to invest in teacher training to ensure quality in their schools. Uh, uh I can I can give you my answer to that and you know and I think you know when I was working for English Up which was the the, the online school that I worked at we put a lot into making sure that you know of the quality of our te teachers you know we were selling basically we were selling subscriptions so you know if, if the students didn't like it they could go somewhere else pretty quickly so you know we were dependent on the quality of our teachers and the ability of our teachers to quickly develop a relationship with those students because if they couldn't do that we lost them you know so we had to be very careful about who we employed we looked for people who were who were able to communicate in this kind of visual channel and and sort of project some personality through it and you know and who were able to keep students happy and, and deliver good lessons and we actually got student ratings at the end of every single lesson. So every class that was taught was rated by the students. And we were constantly looking at that data to make sure that, you know, teachers were cutting it and that students were happy with them. That became very important. And the customer became very, you know, customer satisfaction was crucial in that kind of environment. And so, you know, teacher development and teacher quality was important to deliver that. Thank you. Anyone else? I'm just scrolling up and down at some of the comments. Yeah, it's an interesting comment about st students still willing to pay pre premium for face to face. Yeah, I, I don't know. Maybe premium is going to, I would have thought premium is going to be a lot higher. Potentially premium is double if you, if you know, if you're thinking about half the number of students in the class. Um, you know, that's the way I do the calculation, but, you know, maybe you can calculate it some other way, but. Um, interesting comment about uberfication of, of online teaching being depressing. Potentially it is, you know, I, I think potentially it is, particularly if the, the price starts to slip. You know, if you can make the same, you know, as, as, your, as an uber teacher, uh, as you're making for a classroom hour at the moment, then it, probably it's not so bad. But a lot of that will hinge around money. Um, no, interesting comment about um, offering a mix of face-to-face -face and online and certainly I think that's that's going to go some way towards you know keeping stu uh, students happy um, again there's still going to be pricing issues and and building good quality online especially if it's asynchronous rather than kind of live synchronous can be quite expensive you know uh, what we found at the company that I was working for, you know, we we they had a hundred, they had a teacher that they met online, and they had self-access materials as well that they could do at home. And what we found was everybody wanted those those self-access materials, but nobody used them. You know, we couldn't sell a course without them. But you know, when we sold the course, students used them for about a week, and then you know found that actually what they really wanted was the teacher and they were happier with the teacher and didn't hardly any of them actually use the materials but you know 
marketing still demanded that you provided that resource. Um, there's a question about not liking um, online teaching, but I think you have to do it anyway. First skills to build, I think, you know, is, is your ability to communicate through the camera and, and sort of get used to doing that and seeing yourself on camera. Uh, for me, one of the key things about sort of doing it is actually getting a bit further away from the camera. As you can see, I'm quite far back. I can use my hands, you know, do some, some body language and things like that. If I want to, I can come a bit closer and monitor you. And, but, but, you know, um, what we found was that was one of the biggest shifts student uh, teachers had to make a lot of them were very uncomfortable with the camera either didn't put it somewhere over there kind of out of sight or they had it too close someone some of them had it too low and they were looking up that the students were looking up their nose actually sort of getting comfortable with your camera positioning in it positioning it well and you know and sort of also working with thinking about how we work with your voice in this environment is also quite important you know that's uh, maybe one of the key things to uh, um, get used to. Um, I'll try and pick up on any other questions. I think my oh, mic is working now. Yes, okay. Okay. Sorry, <laughs> I've been talking to myself. Uh, I think w during all that uh, Zoom bombing and all that, uh, somehow I lost my microphone. But in any event, um, there was a question about quality earlier. I don't know if anybody really asked it, but uh, and I grew up in a time, and when I grew up, I mean, I'm retired now. So uh, I was a teacher at a time where you got an MA, you got a PhD, uh, you studied for years, uh, perfecting your field, you did research, things like that. You know, there's a bar that you had to pass and um, obviously people who are working in the Uber environment are not going to have the incentive to do that kind of thing. Do you think this means that the kinds of, the, the people who want to be teachers would take some other field? Because I mean, if, if you can't uh, raise a family, let's say on your teaching salary uh, and get benefits and things like that where you work, um, do you think that, because it appears that, especially coming up, there's going to be a big retrenchment in brick and mortar institutions who are not going to be able to uh, get the, um, the enrollment. And so they're probably not going to be able to pay teachers. So do you think that that's, I mean, you're looking for basically Uber drivers as teachers? Is there a prospect for people who are going to really work at it and make it a true profession and an art? I, I don't know, you know, a, a lot depends on how, how, you know, how well able you're, you are to deliver a good quality product and convince students that this is a good quality product. You know, on the plus side, it's getting easier and easier. The technology is getting much better all the time. Connectivity is getting be much better. So, you know, it's becoming easier to sort of deliver a better product. The other thing that's maybe on our side at the moment is the fact that nearly all businesses are moving over to this kind of communication. And so there are a whole bunch of people who are going to need to feel comfortable doing business, you know, work, doing their work in, and working with this kind of communication and working with, with teams in this kind of communication. So, you know, there's and companies particularly, sort of, I think, around business English and communication skills are more interested in getting quality. So I think there's, you know, the market will remain there, you know, and that will kind of help, help us a little it, to begin with. But, you know, the, it is difficult and, you know, it, it really depends on how, how well able customers are to recognize quality when they get it, or the opposite, to recognize poor, poor quality or, or lack of quality when they don't get quality. You know, what we found it, um, in the past was, you know, when we were trying to sell you know, quality online courses, that a lot of the time students had tried something that was poor and thought that, oh, well, online learning doesn't work for me. You know, when really the problem was, you know, the teacher or the or the, the provider wasn't giving them a quality product. And, you know, 
as we're all now in the kind of the era of the free trial for students, now's the time to establish that, you know, you can deliver something that's really good quality in this way, or I believe that you can, you know, and, sort of, you know, once we, if we can get to that state, then, you know, it's much easier to convince students that, yes, this is worth paying for. And, you know, and students can, can become more discerning about what is, you know, OK, I'm getting a good, good quality product at this school. I went to this other school. It was a bad quality product rather than online work, learning just doesn't work for me kind of thing. I think that's what we need to do, really. I'm just sort of trying to read chat to see if there are any questions I miss. Yeah, there are really questions that can't be answered because we don't really know what's going to happen. But uh, there are yeah. there are some nice benefits of having to change because, as as has been said, you know, the problem, uh, the the normal was the problem. So there are some things about normal that would be nice to change. I mean, for example, air quality is improving, water clarity is improving. And, um, but you know, that's uh, as far as people, people's livelihoods are concerned, it can be, have to be some major shifts and it's really hard to see until like if we get a vaccine, for example, then things might restore what we know is normal a little bit. But uh, in the meantime, yeah. Mm -hmm, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think it would be a little bit as well because, no, okay, if we had a vaccine and this the, the, the virus w went away tomorrow or next week, you know, I think we've still been through this kind of, you know, collective experience, you know, with our students of, of having something very different. And I think for some people, this is going to work better. You know, for some people it works. For some teachers, you know, they're actually going to enjoy doing this. You know, they're going to enjoy being at home. And, you know, some students are going to want to do this rather than, you know, um, go commuting in and, and trying to find somewhere to park and, and those kinds of things. So, you know, I think, you know, there will be a new normal even, even then. I don't think things will go back to being exactly the same. But that's just my opinion. And I, I'm wrong about a lot of stuff. So, you know, I might be wrong about that, too. Yeah, I'm retired. You work from home, um, and but my sons are working in in uh, colleges in Doha, and they're they have kind of the kinds of jobs that I used to have. Um, it's really hard to say what the future of that kind of existence for a teacher that that will raise a family and send the kids to college. You know that sort of thing. You need some stability in that yeah. kind of situation. And I don't see the stability. Although for a lot of teachers, that's a struggle now. You know, mm -hmm. the, the, the you know the EFL market going into language teaching was you know when I was told I, when I was thinking about going into EFL, I was told yes, you can do that for a few years, but that's not a career. You know, and you know it's always been quite a challenging thing to make a career of. And uh, and in some ways, I'm you know I'm in here in the UK, and I would love to teach again, and I can't afford to, you know, because I can't afford to support. A, a family here by you know teaching English so you know I do all these other things as well you know it was ne wasn't really my first choice but you know I, I've had to find creative ways to make a living and you're you know. very creative you're lucky and well I mean we're lucky because you have such wonderful products really I mean the, the things you produce that's, that's what I like to hear I hope everybody heard that wonderful products I, I've, <laughs> yeah, you know, I, sorry. I've also one thing I've really been dying to ask you is what drives those products i mean what do you have are you just pitching to anybody or do you have a, a an audience in mind when you create these uh, marvelous materials which uh, you know um for someone who has who is in a situation where they're forced to teach from a textbook let's say they're you know they're it would be nice to use those as supplementary materials or but uh I'm just wondering how you come up with them because the the topics may or may not be appropriate for some people or um, what drives it? It's, it's very difficult. I mean, you know, I've, I've built up a customer list, which is great. I've got a customer list of about 9,000 customers now. 
and you know and I test things out and see what sells well to them and what doesn't and I get feedback from them and things like that but you know for me a lot of it's about you know I want to enjoy my work so I do work that I enjoy and I hope other people enjoy the, the work as well and and if that happens I guess I make a living and if it doesn't happen then I'm going to be bankrupt soon so you know that that's that's kind of just the way it goes but I've never said you know I try to you know okay I, I draw on my own experience what the kinds of things that I like to do as a teacher and the kinds of things that I felt worked as a teacher and put that into the materials you know um, beyond that I can't say you know if you if, if if somebody said okay this isn't working you just have to do lots of grammar sheets and then you'll be rich I probably wouldn't want to do it because you know that's not you know what I feel works as a teacher and not not where I want to be as you know as producing things so you know I, I produce the kind of materials that I'd love to use as a teacher and hopefully there are other teachers out there who are a bit like me who will kind of buy them or recommend them to their school or, or whatever but you know I just keep my fingers crossed and uh, keep plugging away at it I guess. Well Jeff Magoto who's just commented on your products works at uh, Oregon University and maybe Jeff I don't know how, how do you use Nick's products? If uh, if you do, um, hi there. I'll turn hey, on my mic and video. Um, hi, I train to. The plug. <laughs> <laughs> um, thanks for what you do and all that you've been doing. I um, I didn't expect to hear a talk about uberification of our profession from one of the most creative people in it, but hey. Uh, <laughs> it's not something that I recommend. It's you know, it's but it is. It's kind of like it's it potentially it could just be where we where we're going, and that you know, if that is where we have to go, then we tr you know we have to think about you know being in control of that process and making sure that we go there in a nice way, get a nice Uber there or whatever. Yeah. You know, so, sorry. Anyway, Jeff, you were talking about my wonderful product, so I shouldn't have interrupted. <laughs> <laughs> um. So how do you inspire young teachers to want to create their own materials? How do you inspire them to look at technology in ways that they haven't otherwise done? And um, how do you make concepts like flipped learning quite tangible? That, those are the three reasons why I, I buy your stuff and share your stuff. Um, Great. Good. Fantastic. To go back to, if I can just make one more comment, trying to oh, sure. bookend your comment, Nick, about when you started out in teaching, people said, "Great, but you'll never make you'll never make a living out of it." And Vance's uh, happy retirement on the thirty fifth floor of a beautiful building in in Malaysia, twenty <laughs> fifth floor. Okay, um, I, I guess you know the it's just super important to reiterate the you know, the way the EFL, ELT world changed in these 30 years. Um, because at the beginning it was, you know, do a four week training course with International House and, you know, go off to Egypt kind of, you know, perspective. And, I, I did those two the other way around. I went off to Egypt <laughs> and there I did the four week training course and, you know, here I am now, you know. But, and I think, but, yeah. you know, a whole lot of reasons changed why ELT became the profession it's become. And I guess it's just the same, you know, process that's going to be completely redone in the next 30 years is why yeah. are we relevant and how do we stay relevant and affordable and accessible? Yeah. I mean, on the, on the positive side, or, or maybe this isn't positive, I don't know. But one of the things that always occurs to me is that I'm constantly hearing about this world shortage there are of English language teachers, you know, and where commodity is scarce, the price should go up, you know. And yet, you know, we, we find ourselves in a position where the price is going down, you know, and, what, and we're struggling to get, get well-paid well work, you know, but, you know, where commodities are rare, the price should be go going up. So, you know, it's hard to understand what's happening there. You know. I just, just thought I'd put that out there. Yeah. I have no answers, I'm afraid, for that one. Yeah, with a changing playing field, uh, the yeah. answers, we're just going to have to wait and see, as President Trump keeps yeah. saying. <laughs> yeah. 
Okay, yes. So mm -hmm. to, to, to some extent, I think it also depends on where you want to work as well. You know, we know that different places around the world pay more, you know, at least for physical teachers. You know, if you're going to different places in the world, you can get sort of paid better in one than another, you know, and, you know, and I guess where you want to retire to as well. You know, if you if you want to work in Saudi Arabia and, and retire to Venezuela, then, you know, probably that you, you can sort of earn enough to retire quite well. But, you know, if you want to work in Venezuela and retire to Hong Kong, then you're probably going to have more of a challenge. And, you know, it's just those things really, isn't it? You know? Anyway, I think I've, I've said enough for one day and uh, I'll just flip to the, my last slide, which is a thank you. Um, if you've heard enough wonderful things about my materials, then by all means do check out the catalogue. I'll pass a link here to the presentation for you. It's just gone into the chat if you want to sort of, if you want to access that yourself. And, uh, you know, thanks for coming along. It's been uh, a kind of interesting talk to do. It's nice to get people's reactions and see what they think and, uh, you know, and to throw a few points out there um, for people to think about. And maybe at some point, you know, when once people have thought about all this, we could sort of have a follow up session or something like that or follow it up in some way. You know, it would be nice I have to put our heads together and think about how we could sort of grab your your kind of cooler um, post impressions or something like that. Thanks a lot. Thanks very much for coming and thanks for listening. And sorry about the Zoom bombing. That's a first for me as well. So it was kind of. You know, I think that none of it was on the recording. So yeah, okay. no one would know so. if shh, don't mention it. But um, yes. yeah, so yes, go ahead. It's an experience that I could have done without, probably much like the rest of you, but you know, at least you know what it is now. So. Yeah, okay. thanks. Thanks, thanks, thanks to Heike for helping manage that. Yeah. And thanks, uh, Heike. this has been Learning Together. Uh, I think it's uh, episode 461 or two or something like that. I never can remember. I think Talon uh, episode webinar number 15. And Nick, I really appreciate your coming along and taking your time to do this and your generosity is just legendary and uh, we appreciate the way you share everything you do and uh, I, i've got uh, this will come out as a blog post probably tomorrow right. with a recording and uh, audio and the text chat as well so um i appreciate you doing it and uh everything will be there just as open as you are and i, I hope that's all right okay. with you Great point. Yeah, great. Okay. Thanks. Thanks right. a lot for coming, everyone, and thanks for listening. Okay. Thank you very much. Don't, uh, pass me, back the, pass me back the host, please. Weekend. Can you make me host again? I don't again? know how to do that. You <laughs> mouse over my name and uh, over in the little ellipses, maybe, or the more. Um, oh, it'll make me the let host. Let me find it. I think you're Ooh, already thanks. the host, Vance. I am the yeah, host. I think so, too. Oh, yeah. how did that happen? Oh, okay. It, it, so, I am. I am. I'm sorry, Nick. Sorry to. Yeah, you, you are. It yeah, that's why I can find it. Honest. <laughs> okay, maybe that's how my um, my mic came back. Okay. Well, anyway, thank you very much, everybody, for coming. Sorry, we had to. Uh, we have ten people in the waiting room now, and unfortunately, we weren't able to let many in. But we did manage people, so that's a good lesson to keep a waiting room going. I think with the new Zoom, you can actually start one during your. Uh, uh, you know, if you have that problem, you can start a waiting room and start moving people there. So it doesn't really have to be invoked from the beginning. But anyway, that's the things we're, that we're learning about the Zoom. So thanks very much. And I'll go ahead and kill the recording. Bye, everybody. Thanks. Bye-bye. Okay. Thanks. Have a good weekend. Huh? May 15th, 2020, in case I hadn't mentioned that. Talking with Nick Peachy. I always go for the wrong. I go for the recording at the top. And here it is at the bottom. Okay. Bye-bye.